Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the most exciting event on television, Riot, Righteous Invasion of Truth, presented by the Power Broadcasting Network. Abel Damina is my name. I want to welcome you to the broadcast today. Guys, listen, we're going to have an exciting time in the study of God's word. You know, the entrance of his word giveth light and it giveth understanding to the simple. As you come before the word of God with the simplicity of your heart, ready to be equipped, ready to be empowered, ready to grow, and ready to align with the thoughts of God, the plan and the intent of God for your life. Get ready, it's gonna be an exciting time together today. Call a friend, call a family member, help me share the video. Let's get the word around the world. You know, as a ministry, there's a mandate of God on our lives to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have, in Christ and what Christ can do through you. That's the mandate that is driving us to get this word to you every opportunity we have. Now listen, I have an instruction clearly to set up a global discipleship academy where I'm able to disciple as many of you as are following our teachings, as many of you as have been Christians but nobody has discipled you. Discipleship, it's an opportunity we are somebody that is being discipled is given an opportunity to learn the fundamentals the basics the things that enables you to live out your true realities in christ so that you're able to know who you are in christ what you have in christ and what christ can do through you you know when jesus rose from the dead in matthew chapter 28 verse 18 to 20 he said all power is given to me and then he said you go into all the world and make disciples of all nations teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Discipleship is that opportunity where we're able to teach you all the things that Jesus commanded and help you align with the plan, the purpose, and the will of God for your life. We've pushed out the adverts and I just want you not to be left out. So if you have not been discipled, you want me to disciple you, there's an email on the screen right now. If you shoot an email to that email address, will respond to you quickly because we are getting ready to start the classes. It's going to be online. It's global and online. We're going to give you all the details that gets you enlisted into the class. And it's a free discipleship school. You're not paying any fees. Secondly, those of you that are not able to send emails, we have a WhatsApp number from anywhere in the world. If you shoot us a WhatsApp message, we will send you all the info so you can be a part of the discipleship classes. So we're able to disciple you, equip you, empower you to fulfill the plan and the purpose of God for your life. That's how we start 2022. And thirdly, I have just come out with three books of mine and I want to encourage you to get copies of it. This one is Spirit Life. It's powerful material that helps you right from Genesis the work of the Spirit has not ceased to function in and among men. The Spirit hovered over the waters and God spoke. The scriptures are replete with the work of the Spirit. So in this book, you will learn about the leading of the Spirit. You will learn about knowing how the Father leads his children. You will know about the inward witness, impressions of the Holy Spirit. Powerful book. It will change your life. The second book I just wrote is The Gift and Calling of God. There's a call of God on your life. How to locate that gifting and calling, how to steer it up and walk in the fullness of its reality. The third book is How to Win in Life, Walking in Love. The love of God that never fails. This book will equip you to walk above bitterness, strife. It will equip you to walk above all the things that the devil can offer anybody. And it will help you never to give room to the devil. These are three powerful materials that will change your life. Finally, remember I also have a book, it's called The Christocentric Meal. It's a daily devotional and there are sermon notes that a pastor can preach in his church for three years. They are Christ-centered messages, very sound exegesis. It's called The Christocentric 
mail is on the screen. If you call our office or email our office to order for any of these books or all of it, I'm telling you, our office will get back to you quickly and make sure these materials get to where you are. Don't forget that our mission as a church is to equip and empower you to live out your realities in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. All right, I'm expecting to hear from you today on Discipleship Academy because classes are starting any moment from now. So don't procrastinate, don't delay. Looking forward to hear from you. Now, fasten your seatbelts as I take you on a gospel adventure into the service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy fellowship. Understanding praise and worship. Understanding praise and worship. The book of John chapter 4 verse number 23. But the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshippers, I like to underline that word, true worshippers, true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Next verse. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. When you look at all the sacrificial systems of the Old Testament, we can summarize everything and call it worship. We said that that sacrificial system of offering animals to God can be summarized as worship. Then we began to study a number of things from the book of Hebrews. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 from verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service. That word service there is the word worship. Ordinances of divine worship and a worldly sanctuary. Verse 2. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shewbread, which is called the sanctuary. Verse 3. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Verse 4. Which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Verse 5. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Verse 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second, when the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. The object of the worship was to take the offering into the holiest of all. An animal will stand in the presence of God for the worshippers. So now you can understand what the writer was saying that the way was not yet known. So everything therefore was symbolic. Nothing was true. Everything was symbolic. Look at verse 9 to 12 of Hebrews chapter 9. Which was a figure for the time then present. In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect. As pertaining to the conscience, verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the reformation. Next verse. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, not physical building, but neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So now, if you observe from what we read, we understand that the worship of the Old Testament was symbolic. What they offered was symbolic. 
So both from the tabernacle to where they worshipped, to how they worshipped, from the tabernacle to where they worshipped, to how they worshipped, and what they worshipped, all was symbolic. From the tabernacle to where they worship, how they worship, what they worship, all was symbolic. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1. For the law having a shadow. You see that? The law having the very image of the things can never, if your Bible is mine, I will underline that, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the commerce dear unto perfect so when he says for the law having a shadow of good things to come it now makes sense that whatever was offered under the law was not the true look at verse 2 of hebrews chapter 10 for then will they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins he is saying that their conscience were not purged by the offering that they brought that means they brought an offering that didn't have the power to purge their conscience so the entire sacrificial system of the old covenant was called worship the entire system of sacrifices was called worship let me call our attention to something Look at verse 3 to 5 of Hebrews chapter 10. Please pay attention. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. They were worshipping with sin consciousness. Alright, next verse. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. That verse 4 should be circled. It is not possible. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifices and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. He seems to annul what they were doing. He is saying that what they did did not satisfy the demands where the conscience will be purged. What they did was not good enough to purge them to cleanse them to give them boldness and confidence in their relationship with god and it says again that god had no pleasure in it the entire sacrificial system never pleased god all the animals all the tabernacle everything they did never pleased god so the entire system was worshiped what they were offering was worship. Now, let's examine another Old Testament scripture. Second Chronicles chapter 7. We want to see an example of what they did in the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, which was called worship. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 5 to 7. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 20 and 2,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. Verse 6. And the priests waited on their offices. The Levites also with instruments of music of the Lord. Which David the king had made to praise the Lord. Because his mercy endureth forever. They were praising God not to get his mercy to endure. They were praising God because... His mercy already endured forever. Now when you get home, I'd like you to study all of these chapters quickly. Please take note, study because we will visit them within the course of this teaching. First Chronicles chapter 15. First Chronicles chapter 16. First Chronicles chapter 25. Study all the chapters. 15, 16, 25. Then I'd like you to also study at home. Second Chronicles chapter 5. Second Chronicles chapter 29. Second Chronicles chapter 30. Second Chronicles chapter 5, chapter 29, and chapter 30. Read all of the chapters. Now, it's important you study that at home. Notice that the basis of worship are the offerings that are put on the altar. The basis of worship 
are the offerings that are put on the altar. Then when you get home, further study for you. Deuteronomy 26, 2 Chronicles chapter 6, Psalms chapter 60, Psalms chapter 79, and Psalms chapter 80. You will find descriptions of worship in these chapters. All the things accompanied the worship. The worship itself were the offerings that they brought. And it was brought into the house. Basically, in the pre-law era, they built an altar. And by the time Moses came, they did it in the temple. Before the law, they built an altar as worship. But when the law of Moses came, worship was done in the temple. In the temple because the altar was now situated in the temple. So worship was done in the temple. That is the offering of animal sacrifices was done on the altar that was situated in the temple. So they did it for all the people. Now, when Jesus came, he figuratively described that temple as his father's house. He described that temple as his father's house. Remember that Mark chapter 11, there was an issue when he went and met people selling and buying and trading in the temple. And he said, this house, which is the temple, shall be called a house of petition." Or a house of prayer for all nations. And he said, you have turned it into a den of robbers. When he said house of petition, that word petition or that word prayer means somewhere you come to ask for something. Somewhere you come, the house of petition. My father's house or the house where you come to ask for something. Let us look at what he meant. Mark chapter 11 verse 17. And he taught saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But you have made it a den of thieves. Prayer there is petition. Now, what kind of petition was to be done in his house? What kind of petition? Notice. When Solomon was going to dedicate that temple, look at what Solomon said. First Kings chapter 18 verse 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, come now unto me. And all the people came now unto him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Now look at First Kings 8 verse 30. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant. And of thy people Israel. When they shall pray toward this place. And hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place. And when thou hearest. Forgive. When thou hearest. Forgive. So my father's house shall be called a house of petition. A place where you come to ask for something. What kind of petition? Look at Solomon. Anywhere they stand and pray towards this temple. Here. And when you hear, forgive. Look at that First Kings chapter 8 verse 33. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy. Because they have sinned against thee. And shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray. And make supplication unto thee in this house. Why did he say when people are in captivity and they turn towards this temple? What is in the temple that will make people in captivity to turn towards the temple? There was an offering in the temple. There was worship in the temple. So he says when they pray, when they pray... Answer them. Listen carefully. So the prayer and the praise will be effective based on the worship. The prayer and the praise will be effective 
based on the worship or on the offering the prayer and the praise will be effective based on the worship or on the offering that's very very important now observe the prayer will be effective because it's the temple and the temple is the place where the altar is and the altar is the place where the animal sacrifice is where the worship is jesus said my father's house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations he was basically saying this is what this place is for a place of petition it's called a temple because blood offering is there the reason why it is called temple it is because that is where you put blood offering propitiation for sins atonement is done there the temple is where propitiation atonement or animal blood is kept as worship hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10 has some of these details please pay attention however jesus in matthew chapter 12 verse 6 speaks about a greater temple a greater temple than the other one but i say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple is one greater than the temple so he says he jesus is greater than this temple in matthew chapter 18 verse 20 jesus said where two or three are gathered in my name i am in the midst of them those are post resurrection realities or post redemption realities so without going into this study we know that the death of jesus did not replace the old testament sacrifices the blood of jesus did not replace the old testament sacrifices or the sacrifice of jesus was not a replacement for the old testament sacrifices rather the death of jesus is the reality of what they were foreshadowing the death of jesus is the reality of what they were foreshadowing so the death of jesus is the reality of all the offerings of the old testament is the reality of all the offerings or of the worship of the old testament so we can say from abel to noah to abraham they all foreshadow the reality in christ from abel to noah to abraham they all foreshadow the reality in christ's death and in christ's resurrection and in christ's ascension to the father all of them from abel to noah to abraham they were foreshadowing the reality in christ's death burial resurrection ascension and appearance to the father the book of hebrews will help us to understand this very well look at hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 and 2 now of the things which we have spoken this is the sum we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens verse 2 a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the lord pitched and not man take note of the word true tabernacle true worshipers true tabernacle look at verse 3 to 6 for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern show to thee in the mount verse 6 but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry 
by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises when you get home read the whole of hebrews chapter 9 from verse 1 to 25 you will understand what i'm explaining further look at verse 13 of hebrews chapter 8 in that he saith a new covenant he hath made the first old now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away look at hebrews 9 13 and 14 for if the blood of bulls and of goats that's why the old had to be put away for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to god purge your conscience from dead works to worship the word serve is worship from dead works to worship the living god so to be able to worship the living god your conscience must be purged from dead works look at verse 15 16 and 19 of the same hebrews chapter 9 and for this cause is the mediator of the new testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance for where a testament is there must also of necessity be the death of the testator verse 19 for when moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people notice what happens the effect of those offerings was to be for the people the effect the impact the benefit of the worship was to be for the people not for god was to be for the people so when they finished the sacrifices they took the blood and sprinkled it on the people the blood of the worship was sprinkled on the people because the people were the beneficiaries of the worship not the worshiped god doesn't benefit from our worship our worship only benefits us the blood of the worship was sprinkled on the people what the writer of hebrews is saying is that it deals with the flesh the old testament sacrifices dealt with their flesh but did not affect their conscience but the blood of jesus purifies the conscience it purifies the man himself and you know hebrews chapter 9 sorts out that that jesus goes into heaven itself to offer a more lasting sacrifice than that of the old testament that's the same thing hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 to 13 says look at hebrews chapter 10 verse 2 again for then will they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged the purging is done once because the sacrifice is once the purging of the worshipper is done once once purged should have had no more conscience of sins once the worshiper is purged by jesus what that offering will purge the lasting effect of the purging will be eternal the conscience is not purged every time you pray <laughs> the conscience of the born again man is purged once by that one offering that jesus offered the worshipers once purged 
should have no more consciousness of sin. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once. We are sanctified once. We are purged once. We are righteous once. We are holy once. Everything is one, 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 one. Once. Please stay with me. This is getting exciting. Now look at verse 11. And every priest standed daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins in the Old Testament. Look at verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. 14. For by one offering, he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. So basically, he is saying to us that the offering for worship is the body and the person of Jesus Christ. The offering for worship is the body and the person of Jesus Christ. The basis of that reverence is the propitiation. The basis of that reverence is the propitiation. He is saying that this is the offering of the body of Jesus. So the man who is a worshiper, the man who is a worshiper becomes a true worshiper, not that the other ones were false worshipers. Mm -mm. Not that the Old Testament worshipers were false worshipers, but the Old Testament worshipers were symbolic. They were a foreshadowing. That is what they did was temporal. What Jesus did is eternal. So that eternal nature of what Jesus did is what is called true. True. That is what is called true. So the man who comes in Christ is perfected. The man who comes in Christ is perfected. He is sanctified. The altar where the worshiper was accepted or rejected has been sorted by the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. So, that ended the sacrifices of the Old Testament. It retired those sacrifices and gives a basis for what is called worship in the New Testament. It retired the temporal and gave us a new way. A new way. Glory to God. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entered into that within the veil. Enter into that within the veil. So where is the offering going to? Within the the veil. Jesus doesn't go there dead. In the Old Testament, the animal blood that they took to the altar was the blood of a dead animal. Because it was a shadow. In the New Testament, Jesus does not enter the Holy of Holies dead. He enters the Holy of Holies alive. Verse 20 of Hebrews chapter 6. Without the forerunner is for us entered. Even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus goes in. We saw that when Abraham met Melchizedek, that tithe, please listen carefully, that tithe that Abraham gave to Melchizedek was worship. That tithe was worship not a device to get money that tithe was not a strategy for collecting money 
That is why it was Abraham that offered it. Because it was worship. It was honor. And whatever Melchizedek did was to foreshadow Jesus who doesn't take an offering from us. Jesus doesn't take an offering from us for his mediatorial capacity. Rather, Jesus is the offering for us. That was a shadow. In the reality, we are not the one that offers. It is Jesus that offers himself for us. It's rather shameful that, you know, uh, the church focuses on the material giving. The material giving that is between Melchizedek and Abraham. Rather than focus on the redemptive sacrifice of Jesus. Foreshadowed by whatever Abraham and Melchizedek did. It was the redemptive sacrifice of Jesus foreshadowed. And showing that we are not going to God through Jesus. We are not going to God through the offering that we give. Rather, Jesus is the offering and the high priest at the same time. Jesus himself is the offering and the high priest at the same time. In Luke chapter 18, we see a narrative, and I love this narrative, in Luke chapter 18, of, you know, where you need to understand the, the rudiments of that narration. Luke 18 verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one, a Pharisee, and the other, a publican. Now, please look at me. One thing about going into the temple if you check the Levitical order, the offerings of priesthood, you always go into the temple with something. Always. That's the order. That's why when Peter and John were going to the temple to pray, the beggar was expecting something because you can't come to the temple not having something. It was a custom. It was, it was a protocol of approaching the temple. So, he expected them to have something. Because usually when you come to the temple, you must have something to lay down on the altar. It was protocol in the Old Testament. So look at that, Luke chapter 18, verse 10 to 12. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God... I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, standing afar off means the Pharisees were closer based on their legal standing in the temple. The temple must have an offering. So when he says he could not look up to heaven, talking about the publican, he could not look up to heaven, but said, God, be merciful to me. God, be merciful to me, is the Greek word, hilas komai, hilas komai. It means to be propitiated unto me. God, be propitiated unto me. He was referring to an offering. That means an offering was in view. Be merciful means consider the offering. Consider the propitiation. Now, the difference was the Pharisee was looking at his works. I fast twice. I pay my tithe. I am not like the sinner who doesn't do the works I do. Just like Cain and Abel. The other one was looking at the sacrifice for sins. His eyes was on the animal he brought. And he put his eyes on the animal and said, God, be merciful to me. His eyes were on the sacrifice. His eyes were on the propitiation. So when we are talking about the temple, 
something is always offered on behalf of the person in luke chapter 21 there's a case of a widow who gave all she had more than the rich man again in the temple remember it was to honor god and etc and jesus mentioned the honor of god and the private part of it that whatever you do do it in secret for men not to see matthew chapter 6 then in matthew 18 20 jesus said where two or three are gathered so there is a private aspect and a public aspect there is a private aspect and a public aspect and we will examine both of them some other things like that that had changed for example in the old testament there was a special day for worship where these offerings were brought and all that today has changed today you worship anywhere and you worship any day in acts chapter 2 verse 46 they met daily in first corinthians 16 verse 1 he said upon the first day of the week in acts chapter 19 verse 9 acts 19 verse 9 paul they were meeting daily in acts chapter 20 verse 20 they met from house to house and daily in the temple so basically when we mention worship in john chapter 4 jesus was referring to christian service christian service those that will serve so back to john chapter 4 the woman was saying you say we should come to jerusalem to worship we believe that we worship in the mountain jesus said you don't have to come to this mountain and you don't have to go to jerusalem look at john 4 23 but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeketh the father seeketh such to worship the hour is coming when there will be true worshipers who will worship in spirit and in truth for the father seeketh the same word with the son of man came to seek and to save those that are lost the father seeketh when he said the father seeketh he was referring to the seeking for salvation because it is salvation that makes man a true worshiper it is salvation that makes man a true worshiper it's the offering of jesus christ that makes someone a true worshiper put this down because we will come there so that means worship will involve prayer worship will involve prayer worship will involve teaching 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 it will involve giving prayer teaching giving worship will involve general action of service general action of service worship will involve prophesying prophesying worship will involve singing singing and worship will involve acts of giving it will involve acts of giving but they are only true whether it's teaching or giving or singing or acts of service or prayer it is only true based on the sacrifice of jesus now in john chapter 4 there are two things simple bible understanding look at john 4 22 and 23 you worship you know not what we know what we worship for salvation is of the jews but the hour cometh and now is 
when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. So true worshippers is spirit and in truth. And he repeated it twice. Emphasis. So worship in spirit and in truth makes a man a true worshipper. Worship in spirit and in truth makes a man a true worshipper. Worship in spirit and in truth makes a man a true worshipper. So the word true, true, rather than worship in the mountain, you worship in spirit and in truth. That means that the worship of the new covenant is by the Holy Spirit. The worship of the new covenant is by the Holy Spirit. And it's not talking about singing in tongues. Mm -mm. It's by the Holy Spirit. Which is referring to the basis of Christian service. The basis of Christian service. So, the validity and effectiveness of Christian service. The validity and effectiveness of Christian service will therefore be based on the offering of Jesus Christ. I serve, I worship because Jesus has sacrificed himself for me. So if anything is done outside the view of that offering of Jesus Christ, can it be called true worship? Huh? No. Because true worship is based on what Jesus has done. And a true worshiper is qualified only based on what Jesus has done. Philippians 3 to 4, we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So the minute you see through worship as what you are doing, you have already lost the meaning of through worship. The moment you see through worship as what you yourself are doing, you have lost the meaning of true worship. True worship is based on what Jesus has done. So, if you like, cry. If you like, roll on the ground. You know, sometimes when people are singing and crying, you don't even know why they are crying. They may just be crying because they were sad. You know? They may just be crying because somebody did them something. And as they started singing, they remembered and they started crying. Philippians chapter 3, where we are, verse 2. Beware of dogs. It's not today people started putting that on their doorpost. I hope you know that in the Bible, there is James Bond. James Bond. James a Bond servant. James Bond. <laughs> James Bond. James, a bond servant. James Bond. <laughs> Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concession. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Notice, our focus is in Christ Jesus. Our focus is in Christ Jesus. And he goes further to explain what he was saying. Be careful of those who want to drag you into the law. Things that they did in the flesh. Offerings that they gave in the flesh. Alright? He says... Beware of dogs. He calls them dogs. People in the law, he calls them dogs. 
Then he explains further what he means by we being the circumcision that worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. Verse 4 of that same Philippians chapter 3. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he had whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Next verse. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Alright, so that is the confidence of the flesh. Look at the next verse, verse 6. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Next verse. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them, but dung that I may win Christ. Next verse. And be found in him, glory to God, be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So basically, a man who is made righteous in Christ Jesus is a true worshiper. A man who is made righteous in Christ Jesus is a true worshiper. By virtue of what Christ Jesus has done, that man is a true worshiper. And he said, we have no confidence in what we do. So, the true worshiper is the man that has no confidence in what he has brought to God. The true worshiper is the man that has no confidence in what he has brought to God. Rather, his confidence is what Jesus has brought to God. So basically, a true worshiper is by the Spirit. Question, what is by the Spirit? By the Spirit means by the new birth. By the new birth. So when you hear in spirit and in truth, what is in spirit? John chapter 3 verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So when a man is born of the Spirit, he is in spirit and reality. So that man is a true worshiper. When a man is born of the Spirit, he is in spirit and in reality. So that man is a true worshiper. Because he has come to God through the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus. So in spirit and in truth is not in spirit and honesty. Of course, there's honesty in worship. We will see that, but not in this context. Here, he is referring to what Jesus has done. So when true is used here, it's in contrast with the temporal or the physical offering of the Old Testament. So, we are true worshippers, positionally, by virtue of the new birth, because Jesus has accomplished that on 
our behalf. So it is true because of what Jesus did. It is spirit because of what Jesus has done. So that is why the act of worship flows from the offering. The action of worship will now flow from that sacrifice, that sacrificial offering of Jesus. It flows from the spirit and the truth of our worship. That spirit and truth of our worship is what Jesus has done. What Jesus has done. So because of the sacrifice of Jesus, I am now a true worshiper. Yeah. I'm born of the spirit. So I worship in spirit and in truth. I'm born of God. I'm a true worshiper. I'm a true worshiper. I'm a true worshiper as a result of what Christ has done on my behalf. So worship in the New Testament is an outflow from the sacrifice of Jesus. Hallelujah. The finished work of Christ. So because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we are the circumcision. We are the circumcision. We are the worship of God by virtue of that once and for all sacrifice. So today, I stand as a true worshiper in spirit and in truth. Somebody shout hallelujah. Stand on your feet. That's all I've got for you in this service. Father, we rejoice that everyone connected to this service. Revelation knowledge is flowing freely. Growing big on their inside. The revelation of worship in spirit and in truth. The reality of our relationship with almighty God. All that Christ has made out of us by that one sacrifice. Sanctified, righteous, accepted, blessed, holy, once and for all. True worshippers. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for raising in us a generation of true worshippers. Byproducts of the sacrifice of Jesus. And we give you praise that you take pleasure in seeing us in Christ Jesus. Anyone sick hearing the sound of my voice, be healed in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the blessing in Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I believe you've been affected and impacted by the word of God. Now, I decree and I declare that the word you receive today, revelation knowledge keeps increasing in your heart. You will walk in these realities and you will live an overcomer's life in Jesus name. Amen. Now remember, there's the Global Discipleship Academy and registration is going on right now. It's a free online academy where I equip you and train you on the basics, the fundamentals that helps you to live out the riches of redemption. If you have never been discipled before, even if you're in a church somewhere, you've never been discipled before, you've been a Christian, nobody has discipled you before. Oh my goodness, this is your opportunity. You know, discipleship doesn't mean you're a new Christian. It just means that we're able to take you through certain rudiments that also empowers you to disciple other people in the knowledge of Christ. Second Timothy 2, 2 Paul says to Timothy, the things you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall in turn commit to others. So if you want to join the academy today, don't procrastinate. There's an email address on the screen. You can shoot an email to us right now. And also, there's a WhatsApp number. You can shoot a WhatsApp request and we're willing to quickly make sure you are enlisted in the Global Discipleship Academy. It's an opportunity you don't want to miss at all. Tell other people about it because this is very, very critical and crucial because the foundation of your Christian life is very critical. It determines everything that you do as a child of God. Secondly, my books are available. I want to encourage you to order for them. There's a phone number and there's an email. These are my new books, How to Win in Life, Walking in Love. The second one is The Gifts and Calling of God.
The third one is spirit life. These are new. They just came out. They will empower and equip you to walk in victory. Also, there's a Christocentric meal, our daily devotional material. And you can also use it as a pastor for sermon notes in your church for three good years without repeating any message. It's a tool that empowers and equips you to fulfill your ministry effectively. We love you guys. Always a joy to serve you the grace of God. Till I come back to you again on this same platform. Enjoy the grace of God and be blessed. Amen. Amen to your victory.